Good afternoon to everybody. We welcome you here at Living Word Christian Church in Langley, BC. And we welcome all of you that are able to come and join us in person and also those who are able to join us online. Why don't we all stand up and let's start in the Word of God. From Romans 6, 5 to 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. I'd like to share a little bit of story from somebody whom I know shared this morning a young man who came to a pharmacy told the pharmacist that he needed to buy his drug addiction medication this caused for him to receive the look of judgment from the people around him he looked down and felt ashamed but he humbly took it all and carried on he mumbled to himself my mama loves me this gave him the comfort that he needed. His mama loves him. That's why he wanted to change. Isn't it that we are all broken like this man? That we were once addicted to sin. We all need a second chance. And our God is a God of second chances. Our comfort is his unfailing love for us. He said, come as you are, and I will give you rest. For the life he gives has no more death to it. And our hope is that he will make all things new. It is right to give him thanks and praise today. We don't just spend this day in worship as we always do. But today, we celebrate what he did on the cross. It is Resurrection Day. So I'd like to greet all of you a happy Resurrection Day. He deserves all praise. Amen? So why don't we all put our hearts together and our lips together as we worship the one true God who gave his life for us. Let's sing God so loved. Come all you weary, come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry, drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy.
Yeah. 
Chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, early in the morning, when the world was young, you made life in all its beauty. You gave birth to all that we know. Oh, glory to your name. Early in the morning, when the world least expected it, a newborn child crying in a manger announced that you had come among us, that you were one of us. Oh, glory to your name. Early in the morning, Surrounded by respectable liars and religious leaders and anxious statesmen and silent friends, you accepted the penalty for doing good, for being God. You shouldered and suffered the cross. Glory to your name. Early in the morning, an empty tomb and a voice in a once guarded graveyard proved that you had risen that you had come back to those and for those who had forgotten, denied, and executed you. Oh, glory to your name. Today we celebrate. We celebrate your creation, your life, your death, and your resurrection. Oh, Christ, in your resurrection the heavens and the earth rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By your resurrection, you broke open the gates of hell and destroyed sin and death. Oh, glory to your name. Oh, Christ, keep us victorious over sin. By your resurrection, you raised the dead and brought us from death to life. Guide us in the way of eternal life. By your resurrection, you confounded your guards and executioners, and you filled the disciples with joy. Give us today joy in your service. By your resurrection, you proclaimed good news to the women and apostles and brought salvation to the whole world. As our God and Savior, direct our lives today. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for He is alive and has become the Lord of life. From death you raised us with Him and renewed your gift of life within us. And so today, increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ and, and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life in you. 
through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. This I ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Why don't you take your seats, please? Let me just remind you that following our service today, we're going to enjoy a luncheon together, and if you are here as guests, we would like to uh, very much have you uh, stay behind and enjoy a meal with us and get to know us a little bit better. Also, just a reminder that next Sunday following the service is our next seminar in the Leadership Enrichment course, and really like to strongly encourage the young adults and some of the teens those in the youth group to uh, sign up because I think you will find this seminar very helpful where we talk about um, spiritual fruit and spiritual gifts and spiritual disciplines. So remember that for next Sunday following the service. Okay, children, if you've not already started leaving, you can go out to your special program now. For the rest of us who are here, there were some children who were asked the question, what's heaven like? And I thought I would share with you some of their answers. What's heaven like? Well, one of the children said, there's like this big banquet with turkey legs and pudding and potato chips and ice cream and cake, and you get to eat and eat all day, and there's all kinds of refrigerators that stay open, and you can eat whatever you want except there's no junk food. God hates junk food. Another child responded, In heaven you got your gold houses and people with rings, so it's kind of like down here except more gold and all the people are dead. Another child, Okay, remember how great Christmas was? Well, it's Christmas every day in heaven. One more response from these kids. Heaven is like Disney World without the sweat. Now I wonder, have you ever thought about heaven? Have you ever wondered what heaven might be like? Now I have thought about some of the all too brief moments in my life when I have been filled with wonder or awe or peace or indescribable joy, and I have thought that, you know, maybe heaven is a little bit like those moments that I have reflected upon. I've thought about that moonlit night in the dead of winter, riding my snowmobile through the woods, and it's minus 30 degrees, but I am cozy warm in my winter wear. Uh, the trees are bending low under the weight of the snow, and the, the path that I travel, it sparkles like diamonds as the crisp snow reflects the moonlight. All is quiet and peaceful, and I think, ah, heaven must be at least that good. I've thought about riding my bicycle home around 10.30 p.m. one hot August night. The sun has just set, and the northern lights are now dancing above me, dancing wildly with vivid blue and purple and green and white hues, and, and I feel as though the aurora borealis is God's breath falling down upon me, breathing into me new life and exhilarating me, and I think, oh, heaven must be at least this breathtaking and life-giving. I've thought about paddling along the shores of Great Slave Lake to the mouth of Mosquito Creek, and there tying a small red devil spinner to the end of my fishing rod, reeling in pickerel and northern pike, cast after cast after cast, and I'm thinking, oh, heaven must be at least this easy this relaxing, this rewarding, that's what heaven must be like. I've thought about falling in love and going on a honeymoon 
And four years later, learning that the love of my life is pregnant, and then assisting in the birth of our firstborn, Brandon, and then later, Lindine, and then later, Jared, and rejoicing in that intimate moment, and, and then later on, sometimes crying, but mostly laughing our way through the years of parenting and now grandparenting. All of these lingering memories of family life are filled with wonderful and positive emotions, and I would willingly live them all over again in a heartbeat. And I think, ah, oh, you know, heaven must be at least this wonderful. What is heaven like? Now, I don't know exactly. But I think that I have a diluted, a watered-down taste of heaven, and frankly, it tastes really, really good. It may be watered down, but it is very, very satisfying. And I am pretty certain that heaven is indescribably more, indescribably better than all the good I have ever experienced in this life, and frankly, I'm eager to get there. This place that I am eager to go to, this place that we call heaven, is being prepared by Jesus even as we speak. You may recall that Jesus said in John chapter 4, the first three verses, He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to Myself, that where I am you may be also. You know, it would be good to uh, take some time to study further about the concept of, you know, the Father's house. Uh, to learn more about this house that has many rooms, or, or to talk about the creation of a new heaven and an earth at the end of history, or to learn more about our eternal destinies. But even before trying to understand these things further, there is a more important matter to be addressed. And that matter is, how does a person gain entrance into the Father's house? or into heaven, or into the new creation, or into blessed eternal life. How do you gain entrance into that? Well, there are some rather interesting answers to the question. For example, the great actress Sophia Loren in a USA Today article said this. She said, I'm not a practicant, but I pray. I read the Bible. It's the most beautiful book ever written. I should go to heaven, otherwise it's not nice. I haven't done anything wrong. My conscience is very clean. My soul is as white as those orchids over there, and I should go straight, straight to heaven. The great boxer, Muhammad Ali, in a Reader's Digest interview said, one day we're all going to die and God is going to judge us, our good deeds and our bad deeds. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. Uh, do Loren and Ali have a correct understanding about entrance into heaven? Or what about Fred? Fred, who arrived at the pearly gates ready for his interview with St. Peter. As Pete was running down the questions on his clipboard, he came to this one. And he said to Fred, can you share any experience in your life on earth when you did something that was purely unselfish? And Fred answered rather quickly, well, yes, I have something you might be interested in. One day I was walking along and I saw a little old lady being attacked by a group of motorcycle thugs. I ran towards her and I, I jerked her from the grasp of a huge, burly, bearded brute. 
Then I kicked over his Harley to distract him while I hustled her into the arms of another passerby for safety. And then I turned back towards the gang and I started fighting with the whole bunch of them tooth and nail and I got in some terrific punches. I kicked the ringleader in the shins and I gave another a great shot right in the gut with my fist. And St. Peter was deeply impressed. Tell me, he asked, Fred, when did this happen? And Fred looked at his watch and said, oh, about two minutes ago. How does a person gain entrance into heaven? Is it by doing something unselfish, by doing a good deed, even at the cost of your life? Is it by living a life in which the good outweighs the bad? During this Holy Week, Christians have given special attention to Jesus, to His journey into Jerusalem, to His Last Supper, to His death, to His burial, and to His resurrection. The events of Holy Week declare that our sins can be forgiven, that we can live a life that is full of meaning and direction and purpose, and that at the end of this life we can be assured of eternal life in heaven. Now let's take a look at what Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 43, teaches us about eternal life and heaven. So I'm going to read Luke 23, starting at verse 32. Here it says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Him, that is Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified Him and the criminals, one on His right and one on His left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide His garment. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Here in verses 35 to 39, we see Jesus being mocked and insulted. And the great irony is that all that was said in mockery was actually the truth. Jesus is who the mocking crowds say He is. He is the Christ of God. He is the chosen one. He is the giver of salvation. He is the King of the Jews. And even though the mocking crowds do not perceive it or understand it. Jesus is saving others. Even as Jesus is dying on the cross, He is saving people. In verses 40 and 41, there is a criminal who admits his sin, his law-breaking, and he accepts his punishment. In this moment, the criminal has made his confession. And then in verse 42, we discover that this confessing criminal expects Jesus to return someday as the Messiah to set up His kingdom on earth. The criminal 
has some understanding of a grander plan. He has a somewhat larger view of Jesus. He fully expects Jesus to die on the cross just as He Himself will die, but there is something true. There is something attractive. There is something right about Jesus that will result in Him conquering death and setting up a kingdom. And so, along with confession, this criminal turns his life over to Jesus. He yields control to Jesus. However the future unfolds for Jesus, the criminal asks Jesus to remember him. To remember to remember does not simply mean to take note of Him. It actually means to save Him. When He says, remember me, He is asking Jesus to save Him. You see, the criminal recognizes his sin. He confesses that in contrast to Jesus, he is receiving the due reward for his deeds. Justice is being served upon the criminal. And from this place of just punishment, the criminal asks Jesus to remember him. He asks Jesus to save him. And what does Jesus do in verse 43? He claims a great victory, and He issues a bold declaration. At this very moment, we see Jesus accepting, as it were, a trophy of victory, a justly condemned criminal, a dying sinner at this moment is saved. And Jesus boldly declares that this saved, this redeemed sinner will today, will immediately, with no waiting period, no purgatory, enter into paradise with Jesus. Paradise is the dwelling place of God, or the place that we typically refer to as heaven. Now, what a bold declaration. What a splendid assurance. A sinner is saved in this moment and is bound for heaven. But wait a minute. What about a life of good works and holy behavior? What about keeping the Ten Commandments or at the very least the two great commandments? What about proving that you are worthy of of heaven. You mean that this criminal gets into heaven a deathbed confession? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely, for this is the marvelous saving mercy and grace of God in Jesus. As long as a person's heart beats, Jesus is extending the invitation to confess sins and to find forgiveness, to be saved, and to enter into paradise. It is only through Jesus' forgiveness that anyone is able to enter heaven. You can't work your way in. You can't talk your way in. And you can't buy your way in, and you can't earn your way in. And I'm sorry, your mommy and your daddy, they can't get you in. Uh, attending church faithfully will not get you in, and, and being unselfish will not get you in, and giving up your life to protect a senior citizen will not get you in, and keeping the law will not get you in, and tithing won't get you in, and, and serving your country won't get you in, and feeding the poor won't get you in. Being nice will not get you into heaven. Only confessing sins and inviting Jesus to save you will get you in. And as soon as you confess your sins and your need for Jesus to be your Savior, He speaks those beautiful words of assurance and He makes this bold declaration, you will be with me in paradise. What a profound 
What a beautiful, what a reassuring word. You will be with me in paradise. A little earlier in Jesus' life, one of his closest friends, Lazarus, died. John chapter 11, verses 19 to 26 give us the details of that event. We read there that many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother Lazarus. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet Him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Dear friends, I want to ask you the same question that Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? If you are facing particular hardship in your life at this moment, if you are sick or aging or approaching your own death, if there is more darkness or sorrow or despair in your life than you think you can handle, remind yourself that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And this is what we are celebrating today. Whoever believes in Jesus will live even though he dies. Hold tightly to the promise made to the criminal. You will be with me in paradise. Thank God for such assurance. Let that assurance inspire and comfort you day after day after day, no matter what those days may hold. And if perchance you do not have the assurance that Jesus has forgiven you, that Jesus is your Savior and your friend, and that you will live with Him forever in heaven, then I want to encourage you to speak to me or to speak to one of your Christian friends so that we can guide you into that experience and into that assurance of being forgiven, of being reconciled to God and having eternal life as your destiny. My dear family, my brothers and my sisters, please find comfort in Jesus' bold declaration. You will never be left hanging on your own personal cross of suffering or heartache or disappointment or death. Be courageous in light of what Jesus declares. You will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. Do you believe this? Yes. We will live even though we die and we will be with Him. This is the bold declaration. This is what we celebrate today. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. And His promise to us is that we will be with Him in paradise. Believe this. Live with this assurance. We will be with Him. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite the worship team Please come and lead us in one more song. Thank you, Pastor, for that wonderful message. Just wonderful to know the salvation that the Lord Jesus has given us. It's too wonderful to know that, that we ought to share that to others. Amen. Why don't we all stand up? and
sing our blessed assurance in Christ Jesus.
Eternal Savior, we have seen in your victory our hope realized, our faith confirmed, our strength renewed. As we go from here, may the victory of the risen Christ be your victory. And family, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all today and forever. Amen. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. To the love of Christ, of His life, death, and resurrection, till that promised day when He comes again, I will rest in complete assurance. I will.